comport. For Thanks, Siri. Um, okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our virtual discussion of authors Miranda Mellis and Allison Cobb's Demystifications and Plastic and Autobiography, respectively. Allison didn't write demystifications and Miranda didn't write plastic. Anyway, I also just wanted to introduce you to our newest ORCA staff member, Socorro De Luca. She'll be co-hosting with me today and will be helping with some events in the near future. It's her first day. And we're really excited. Um, so. At this virtual event, uh, we have Miranda and Allison here today to talk about their books with us. Um, we also have copies of Plastic in the store, and we will have demystifications in the store in the next week or so. Um, so uh, let's get some blurbs. Miranda, Miranda Mellis is the author of Demystifications, The Revisionist, The Spokes, None of This is Real, The Quarry, and Materialisms. She co-authored The Instead with Emily Abendroth and co-edited the Encyclopedia Project. She lives in the Pacific Northwest and teaches at the Evergreen State College. Allison Cobb is the author of Plastic and Autobiography from Night Boat, Night Boat Books. Her other books include After We All Died, Born Two, and Greenwood, originally published by Factory School with a new edition in 2018 from Night Boat Books. After a reading and discussion between the two authors, we will be doing an audience Q&A so get your questions ready. Um, we also, as you heard the voice say, we plan to record the event. So if you don't want to appear on video, please keep your cameras disabled and also keep yourselves on mute um, until it's time for uh, questions and answers. Let's see. So Miranda, Allison, I give the floor to you. Thank you so much for having both of us. I, I really admire a cooperative bookstore and all the work that you do. So it's especially an honor and an honor to read with Miranda and with the people in this crowd. I have many heroes and beloved in this crowd. Thank you all for being here um, on a video camera on a Friday afternoon and evening. It's such a pleasure. Um, so I, uh, we thought that I could kick things off with a brief reading from this book, Plastic an autobiography. Um, it's a prose book. I'm just going to read um, an excerpt from the preface, but I also wanted to read the epigraph to the book because Miranda and I chatted and we thought this could be a kind of a nice way of orienting the event um, at, because we really felt like we both relate to this in our, in our work as artists and scholars and people. Uh, so the epigraph for the book comes from the physicist, Karen Barad, and it is, knowing does not come from standing at a distance and representing, but rather from a direct material engagement with the world. Um, so plastic and autobiography, um, the preface also has an epigraph from the writer Rebecca Solnit that says, I wanted to trace the lost patterns that came before the world was broken and find the new ones we could make out of the shards. The thing turned up in a corner of the yard just outside the fence. I found it when I went out to take Quincy for a walk. Curved and black, plastic, four feet long, a foot at its widest. I thought at first it was a car bumper. I put it in the grass by the porch. The next morning, it was still there. I sat next to it in the sun and looked closely. It was not the first piece of plastic junk I had sat staring at. For nearly a year, I'd been picking up all the plastic I found on my daily dog walk. I'd been arranging it into patterns, taking photographs. I'd been storing it all up in plastic garbage bags on the back porch. I didn't know exactly why I was doing this. I wanted to understand something. Plastic on the dog walk, plastic on visits to the beach, plastic studying the ground everywhere I looked. I gathered it all up. I am the no and the yes. A line from poet Anna Sobelman's first book. It has lived with me for years, sometimes whispering through my mind in its old remembered rhythm. In the poem, Sobelman follows the line with a qualifying phrase. She narrows it, makes it domestic. But I want the raw declaration hanging there on the turn of itself. 
I am the no and the yes. For nearly half my life, I've worked for an environmental group. I spend most of my days in front of a computer screen taking in a deluge of, planetary, of information about planetary trauma and emergency. Most of it floods through me, too vast to grasp. But plastic was a shard that stuck. Plastic I could touch, and it could touch me back. I dragged the car part inside the house. Nearly 10 years later, it sits beside me near my desk. I learned this, that the world is not broken, or that it has always been shards, kaleidoscopically interwoven, not one world, many threaded through one another, like fungus hyphae through soil. Worlds end. As Catherine Yusoff points out, in a billion black Anthropocenes or none, some worlds have ended over and over, lives consumed and discarded by individuals woven into systems that give them life and death power, like settler colonialism, like capitalism. These are systems built by humans, but they exceed individuals. They extend across generations and geographies, planet scale forces of destruction. Plastic waste stems from this same consume and dispose violence. I learned that waste is not an unintended consequence of a miracle new technology. Waste is inherent in plastic production as it accelerated after World War II. In 1945, days before the US military incinerated two cities with atomic bombs, a DuPont executive looked forward to the end of the war and the surge of buying that would follow as soldiers returned home and bought houses and cars, washing machines and refrigerators. The job ahead, he told a group of marketing experts, see to it that Americans are never satisfied. Plastic embodies this infinite desire. Conjured out of gas and oil, the seemingly endless reservoirs of dead plants and animals underlying earth, plastic transmutes death into eternal life. The word plastic refers not to any specific object, just the quality of a material, that it is capable of taking shape, an endless stream of shapes. Objects formed from plastic ease suffering and save lives, artificial hearts, IV bags, the tubes snaking out of a respirator. Plastic makes cars safer, airplanes lighter, and delivers drinking water. The single largest use of plastic, though, is for containing other objects. 40% of plastic goes into packaging to be used once and then discarded, driving endless demand for more. Companies work to keep these facts hidden. When the evidence becomes too overwhelming, plastic clogging roadsides, oceans, living bodies, companies shift responsibility onto individuals through things like anti-littering campaigns and ensure that taxpayers and municipalities pay the tab for managing the waste. The lives harmed at every step, human and non-human, drop out of the equation. The same consume and dispose violence threads through me also. It has benefited me my whole life. I grew up the daughter of a nuclear physicist in Los Alamos, the town that built the atomic bombs, which ended some lives in order to save others perceived to have more value. We are woven into the same net, me and bombs and this car part. For a decade, I followed threads that tie us together through airplanes and sailors, the hydrogen bomb, Pacific Islands, the Nazis and Heidegger. I followed threads through silence, loss and grief, through the birth of chemistry and the invention of radar, through patriarchy, empire and chattel slavery. I followed threads through apologies and their failure, through a pandemic and an uprising and living lungs struggling to breathe, through old wounds and new ones, hurt reverberating aching to be remembered. This object, a book and its journeys, this broken down car part, its life. This is my no. 
I have wanted this car part and its entanglements, often ugly ones and painful, to leave me. I have wanted not to have to face in my privilege the terms of its existence. I learned this. There's nowhere to go. The same terms that made this piece of plastic made me, my own body, and each of my breaths. This is also, it must be, my yes. So that's the preface of Plastic and Autobiography. And I think uh, Miranda and I will talk a little bit about both books, but first Miranda will read for us, I hope. Thank you so much, Allison. It's amazing to hear from that book again. Um, and thank you for reading with me. Thanks to all of you for coming and to Orca Books. I also wanna thank Solid Objects for putting out this book of mine, Demystifications, and Katie Imar for creating a, an amazing index that goes in the back pocket of the book. Um, but before I read, I'm going to read a little bit from this book, but before that, I, I'm gonna read from a work in progress. Um, and I wanted just to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the traditional lands of the Medicine Creek Treaty Tribes, which include Squaxin Island, Nisqually Indian Tribe, and Puyallup Tribe of Indians. Um, so I'm going to read a couple of pages excerpted from this work in progress, a multi-genre novel called Two Problems in Three Parts. And in the section I'm reading from, the narrator is remembering their mother who's disappeared after a consequential militant direct action. The narrator lives in a house that's sliding down a ravine due to erosion caused by prior clear cutting and climate change related monsoon. And that's all in the first section of the book, which is in verse. This part is from the third section of the book and is focused on the narrator's memories of their mother as they try to make sense of her disappearance. I remember the last time I went to class with my mother right before she was fired before her final day. She had failed to take off her muddy rubber boots before entering the school. She paced, dirtying the clean floor. I could see her students withdraw, fold inward. A few looked at her expectantly, anxiously. Others daydreamed or looked out the window half-heartedly. Others listened to music. Doodled. I understood exactly how they felt. Who wouldn't rather listen to music, birds, or nothing? Suddenly, one student stood and pointed. Everyone turned to see, surprised, a red-tailed hawk sitting on top of a street lamp outside the class window, regarding us impassively, yet somehow, or so it seemed to me, with a kind of motivated interest, as if it wanted to tell us something but wasn't at liberty to do so. We all looked in silence, and then the hawk winged away and my mother began to teach. We sat down, we faced her, now we were attentive. The masters of suspicion, she said, they posited an imaginary world in which imaginary worlds don't exist. She read a passage from the future of an illusion. When Saint Boniface cut down the tree that was venerated as sacred by the Saxons, the bystanders expected some fearful event to follow upon the sacrilege, but nothing happened and the Saxons accepted baptism. She placed the book down and leaned on the table with both hands and said gravely, insistently, but of course something happened when he cut down the sacred tree. It just didn't happen to them right away. They should have waited a little longer. They were right to fear the cutting of the sacred tree. When they gave up their sacred tree, they became contaminated with the saint's arrogance and it became thinkable for them to go all over the world cutting everyone's sacred trees and reducing all trees to one crucifixion. The catastrophe of the cutting of sacred trees redounds on their descendants and eventually on everyone. She then asked us to get into pairs and make shapes and movements with our hands and mirror each other's gestures. It was surprisingly easy to do. I felt the space between myself and my partner grow palpably thicker when we moved closer to each other and then thin as we moved away, the air becoming malleable material as subtle clay. 
She ignored progress, assessment, homework, tests, eschewed lectures, seminar, analysis, instead playing games, reading aloud from books that interested her, playing music while students talked or drew pictures, making comments in no particular order, going for walks. Students began to drink and smoke openly in her classroom. Of course, this was not what she was supposed to do. To be sure, her job was to assess and grade them, to teach as if history thought one thing after another in order as if one's job was to arrive at the end of history and close the book, as if her students were images waiting to become bodies. The fact was she was not played to pay games with her students, to speak about history as if it were a spiral or constellation, <clears throat> let alone countenance their parting, but she had already been fired. In that time, we would go to the woods and walk among Douglas fir, hemlock, alder, cedar, and the rarer Pacific yew. <clears throat> She would talk about work endlessly and I would listen, though I admit my mind would wander and I would find myself forgetting all about her. I would stop to look at a bracket fastened to a tree or the frilled turkey tail fluttering out from a stump like an ear or a skirt. When we stopped to look more closely at some bit of earth, she would stop too, but she would keep talking. She hardly noticed her arms and hands moved continuously. If we walked in the morning, the light haloed the farther woods as the sun rose. Branches moved in every possible direction, up, out, sideways, downward, crisscrossing, fallen, just beginning, ending, looking, seeking, moving everywhere to find sun for proliferating tiny needles, flat and hand-like of cedar, chaotic like a broken thumb piano of hemlock, adaptable is what I am, it is what we are, above all, we adapt, but she could not adapt. So that is um, a segment of that story part of that manuscript. And, and now I'll read some demystifications for you. And then I'll ask Allison a question and we'll go from there. So the demystifications are numbered one to 99 and I'm starting at 32. Sometimes you arbitrarily encounter a piece of writing that makes you feel this is the key to my whole existence. It makes sense that someone's mind gave you access to yours, someone's body gave you your body too. But what about this reading that has unlocked you? What if you had never come across it? Why does it happen repeatedly with different writings? How many such keys are there to your existence? Three? Ninety? Seven thousand? Countless? Thirty-three. Can I see that which I am outside of? Can I see that which I am not outside of? Amieka wrote, I'm going to draw a line straight through it. Thirty-four. In the future, they had speculative temperaments. Speaking languages and practicing art forms was entertainment. Is there music on Mars? Do androids dream of electric sheep? What was it about the subjective mind that made it feel so private? Our minds are always ready to render the world into experience. What other kind of mind might there be? Could objectivity reach across to other worlds if the facts of other worlds and the facts of ours were not shared? What logic would form the basis of our commonality? The logic of concepts, abstractions, numbers, dreams? Could worlds made of dreaming exist and how could we discover them? When all of the world's problems were solved, we became cosmologists. 35, the spirit is willing, what about the flesh? The flesh is too. How about history? History has no plan. 36. We have a fight about ferns. A bee angrily chases me away from the lavender. I fall, break nothing. That's my run-in with the law of nature today. Thirty-seven, vulnerability, a timeless antique. Thirty-eight, your silence feels vindictive. Maybe you're just busy, busy feeling hostile. 
you're angry because I've understood you. You're angry because I've misunderstood you. Your revenge will be to make yourself too important to reply, but it won't work. I've known you too long. That is to say, you're already too important to me. Your new importance means nothing to the ones who love you best. 39, dear pro-lifers, you've mistaken your atavistic fantasy for historical necessity. Your perceptions are metaphors, your metaphors are symptoms. A rudimentary dose of empiricism would be transformative for you. Your discourse is a landfill disguised as nature. Your edifice crumbles on a sinking island. Self-criticism is preferable to ideology. Try, as Paul Ceylon put it, two mouthfuls of silence. D.W. Winnicott wrote, it appalls me to think how much deep change I have prevented or delayed by my personal need to interpret. 40. Kurt Gray wrote, in the bright light of moral condemnation, harm is a ubiquitous shadow. If you can't see it from where you're standing, just shift your perspective. The shoes of self-righteousness are tight. You have to take them off sometimes. 41, the circle of fifths, it's a dictionary of all keys. Demystifications is a key ring a circle of keys. Remember making mobiles with old keys and hanging them from hangers? 42, do you know the word dialogue? How about conversation? It's not the same as monologue where one person talks the whole time. 43, not antisocial, gregarious with fairies. 44, I'll take my, my small talk dry. 45, to show that an idea has a history in order to reclaim it. To show that an idea has a history in order to debunk it. History exhibiting rationales. 46, Brian Teer wrote, illness keeps a little calendar. Nietzsche wrote, for there is no health as such, and all attempts to define a thing that way have been wretched failures. 47, Robert Kochik wrote, an architecture based on the stress response would above all dispel the delusion that individual and collective interests are at odds, a dichotomy responsible for the greater part of our wretchedness. When militarized borders, fences and walls had all been torn down, turned to sculpture, when the seas had been restored to the right alkalinity, fish returned, skies full of birds again, forests with animals, when the rains fell in their turn, ice pack back, when everyone had medicine, food, housing, gardens, tools, and schools, the prisons closed, the wars ended, all feeling beings across time and space experience knowledge as a collective organ. 48, Susan Buck Morse quoting Walter Benjamin wrote, wish images innervate the technical organ of the collective, supplying it with nerve stimulation that prompts revolutionary action, like the child who learns the practical task of grasping by trying impossibly to catch the moon in its hands. 49, though we should not take our perceptions too literally, we should remember that perception is always relative. What we perceive together dissolves us into connection. We meet at a vanishing point of perspective converge into shared understanding and its object. The world, the moon and the sun are round. We all know that roundness and all of the dead have known it. This brings the living and the dead together. We are that which transpires and it's not nothing to know it. The planet's roundness, it's many rocks, a thin sliver of shared atmosphere though, who knows what air means apart from breathing. 
50. After hearing demystifications one through 45, at a Midwestern university, a man comes close and asks, must ideology critique now come in the form of memes? Is ideology critique becoming stupefied? This was a man whose legend preceded him, see demystification number 29, by about two feet. One heard his rhetorical question well before his mouth opened, see demystification number two. I'm going to skip ahead and read two more. 53. She paused to see if she could sense the time being and heard the low rumble of the planet turning. 54. Who regales the world on the topic of individual freedom, having stolen everything, even that concept? Thank you for listening to that. I just want to hold up Katie Imar's beautiful index, which I wish she could be here to talk about it, but she can't. But anyway, she made this amazing, complex, poetic index that goes in the back of the book. Um, and it's, I just, I'm so honored that she did that. And I, okay, so what I want to do is start this conversation with, with Allison, if I may, by turning to a section of plastic, Allison, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. So there's a section called Sorry, and you're with Yukio, a collaborator of yours. And <clears throat> you're talking about apologies. And I'm just gonna read a paragraph and then I'll pose my question. Yukio wanted to know what I thought about this. We spoke about apologies and what they mean about how the word sorry is misused to manipulate others or evade accountability. We talked about what an authentic apology might be and what it might accomplish. Yukio resisted the idea that apology might need to accomplish anything or anything we could measure. What if it's just something that happens inside? A way of being, she asked. And then later, the end of this section ends with um, Yukio told me many paragraphs later, in the moment, thank you. She did not offer forgiveness and I did not ask for it. It was a way of being kind of apology. Um, and I, I just, I resonated with this and it, and it gave me a term or it gave me a, um, an, an idea about something we could call for, for our conversation, political intimacy. Mm. And this opening in a moment in that section, um, Allison writes about suddenly having this realization that they were talking about apologies and, and she writes, and that's when it struck me, I'd been sitting here with this friend I love in front of me speaking intellectually of global apologies for nuclear technology and everyone's considered apologizing to her and then goes the prose continues and it's and it's an apology. I'm sorry, Yukio, your family has suffered so much from nuclear weapons and war, and it goes from there. And so it's this moment when you take on, um, you open to stand for that which you want to see stood for in this intimate space of relationship, in this political, I'm saying political intimacy. And it just made me think about how intimate redress and repair is because of how intimate harm is. Mm. Um, and I, you know, I always learn so much from reading, reading your work, your exemplary mm. work. Um, so that, I just wanted to kind of put that out there and see where you want to go with it. Oh, thank you, Miranda. As usual, you've like very incisively lapped into one of the sort of key key turns of the book, which is that um, Yukio, so I, as I mentioned in the preface, come from Los Alamos where the atomic bombs were made and Yukio, who is, Yukio Kawano is a visual artist here in Portland who comes from Hiroshima. Uh, she's a third generation Habaksha, which is the Japanese word for um, atomic bomb survivor. Grandparents on both sides of her family survived the bombing. And we have collaborated for a number of years. And I, I love the phrase political intimacy because I think Yuki and I have become very dear friends and, and sort of all along the way been doing a kind of conscious performance of political intimacy um, 
in our collaborations, but also just in our friendship. Um, Yuki does a lot more golf crossing than I do, right? Because she speaks in English to me. She has made a cultural transition to this country. So I'm also always aware that she's doing a lot of work for that to happen. Um, and the apology was a, um, was a spontaneous event where I realized we'd been speaking intellectually and then I was looking at this friend I love and I had never occurred to me to apologize to her for all she'd suffered. And it was a really transformative moment um, and she didn't forgive me. And I think that I have, uh, you know, I think that our relationship and maybe my whole life in a way is learning that way of being kind of apology. There are other apologies in the book that fail. And I did a little bit of research on apology and learned um, that according to some theorists, it, it contains three elements, which is uh, responsibility. So taking you know, ownership of the harm that happened, um, remorse, so sorrow that it happened, and then reparations, making it whole again. Um, and the other sort of tenet of apology is that it's a long-term commitment. It's not a thing that happens once. So it is that kind of way. It's a relationship and a commitment. And um, one of the things I do in the book is visit um, communities of color along the Gulf Coast, the Gulf of Mexico coast that live in the shadow of these massive plastic plants. And there's an apology that happens there that fails because I don't have the elements of long-term commitment and relationship. Um, with that person from that community. So um, that was a, a kind of um, embodied knowledge, you know, the, the idea of our idea of direct material engagement in the world. I think that what I was what I was wanting to do with this book was have a very material engagement with plastic and with the politics of plastic and with the people's lives who are affected and all the ways those tendrils reach out from my own life. And and so I think that apology requires that di direct material engagement or intimacy with another person in another life. Um, so it just feels um, very much of a piece of what um, of what we're kind of engaged with here, which is that it is an intimacy, I think, um, um, not only with with other people's lives, but with forests, trees books, um, all sorts of objects as a kind of politics. Um, I love your um, quote from your demystifications book, Miranda, knowledge as a collective organ, as this kind of you know vision of the world when things are healed, that we could have knowledge as a shared thing among us, which is of course what knowledge is. Uh, but there's all of this sort of private property, intellectual property stuff that happens around knowledge and claims being staked. And so I just love that idea. Um, and I was thinking about that also um, when you were reading your first piece of work, um, the beautiful passage about the teacher who doesn't teach and yet engages in this radical act of just being with her students and teaches them not history as a series of linear events, but as spirals and constellations, um, which is of course what it is. And I was feeling that in your book and I actually felt that in writing my own book that, the, the, so the, your book is this set of numbered, very short numbered sections um, and, it, and it proceeds linearly, numerically as you page through a book. But then this thing happened, which is this incredible, I don't know that people can see this on the camera really, but it's this incredible index. And there's this artwork in the center that you can just maybe get a sense that shows all of the overlapping themes in the book. And it seems like maybe the book in a way wants to be this. And so I would just love to hear what you have to say about how this happened um, and why. Yeah, thank you. I think that's, yeah. I think of each, every book as having its, having its index, right? And it can be implicit or um, it can be at the back of the book as a kind of sub subterranean underwater thing that you might go to, to bounce out of the text. Um, to move, um, to move where the text might take you elsewhere. Um, and in this case though, the, the, the book itself is already in some ways 
an index because it's a commonplace book, right? It has, it's this tissue of quotations, this web of quotations woven in and out with these kind of aphorisms and poems and so on. Um, and so in a way, I think of the index that Katie Imar made as a, as a, um, as a continuation of that, but it's through her poetics and it's through, and it's, and it's manifesting the, um, it's manifesting a different rhythm because there are rhythms, like there are, there's this pacing where that there are segments of demystification several in a row that kind of speak to each other. And then there's a break um, and, and sort of themes that, that, that kind of are converge together kind of notes or tones or attitudes, and then they melt away um, and into something else. Um, but but this, is, this is really more um, sort of weaving all of it both together and then weaving it, really weaving it out. Um, and um, creating, creating, yeah, this circularity, the cyclicalness of reading. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And it's got a beautiful, I mean, it's so visually beautiful. And um, so when you were writing the book, were you conceiving of an index like that? Or was that fully her vision that she brought? Well, I, I, Emily Abendroth, who's here, hi, Emily, and I had uh, written a book length dialogue called The Instead. <laughs> hi. And, um, at, and, we, and we asked Katie to do an index for that book, um, which we, we placed at the beginning as almost a kind of table of contents, like as a way of navigating the book. Um, and, um, and so then when, when I made this book, I just wanted another, <laughs> wanted another index from her. And I asked her, and I know she loves doing it and she loves, she does it in, a, in this special kind of way as an artist. Um, and um, I didn't necessarily, I didn't have that in mind at all when I was writing it, when I was composing it. Yeah, it really came later. Yeah. So, I mean, you kind of have the freedom there with the, um you know, with, as you said, the commonplace form, because you, you have numbered sections, but you can be really fluid. And I think in a, in a, in a similar but different way, you know, because the, the plastic book has, has much more extended prose, but I wrote it in really short sections. Um, you know, no section um, is more than, you know, there is no section that's more than 10 pages long. Um, and and I also shuffled them. They don't follow in a narrative, in a linear narrative, right? They kind of interweave and inter uh, overlap with each other, which is what I wanted to do because I wanted to show like these nets that were sort of all entangled in where we're connected with plastic and connected with history and connected with the future. And I was envisioning that as I was writing the book and trying to get a hold of it. And I drew, your um, index reminded me of this sort of terrible map that I drew at one point when I was composing the plastic book to try to represent that. I'm not an artist, so you can see my bad version. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's, that's me. <laughs> Which is really beat up and has traveled a bunch. <laughs> There's my failed index. My book doesn't have an index, but maybe someday I could get an index like that because I love it. Um, I was also thinking, Miranda, as you read, how funny you are and how funny this book is at points where it's just, and how sharp, like so delightfully sharp and the, the image of the person coming up to the speaker and like having a critique about ideology and <laughs> as meme, which someone needs to teach that person what a meme actually is. But, um, and then <laughs> the sort of like wonderful, like I, I knew, you know, what was, she knew what was going to come out of his mouth before it happened. And then the referencing back to the other part of the book. So I was just curious how, how you see humor functioning um, in this work. And you, you have such a wonderful, like playful and lively sense of the world. So maybe not humor so much as the ha ha joke, but, but yeah, just how, how, what's your relationship to, to humor? Well, it's just like your dog just walked in through the door, you know, um, and kind of broke the, yeah, just, I think it has something to do with that. It's, it's stepping on my map. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a moment, that moment of surprise, I think. And with demystifications, you know, that notion of demystifying, like of subtracting, taking something away to show something else, um, I think can have inherent senses of humor and surprise um, 
you know, I've been thinking about the book as being operating in the key of D, D mystification, D depression, D construction, just um, um, what, what can we move a little bit over to the side in order to see something, something else? Um, yeah, so maybe it, maybe the comedy works in that way and, and um, yeah, less through a kind of, I mean, I think there's a fair amount of something along the lines of a pun, pun punning sensibility going mm -hmm. on with, with a, a kind of didactic aim. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. And repetition. Didactic and, funny. That's that's what that's what we can call. It. Right. Well, sort of the teaching without teaching. And I mean you it was interesting the other words you used for with D because the other ones are all a sort of the negative, right? Depressed, deconstruction, but demystification is a promise of clarity that's like removed at the same time. Like the teacher who doesn't teach, right? <laughs> like you, it's a promise demystification that doesn't happen. And so that seems like a little bit of a displacing also. Um, but also I was struck when you were reading in this very, um, like the radical act of the teacher who's actually like giving life to students by letting them exist and, and fold into their existence. I was thinking about this book as a kind of like, it's it's very sort of, you, you call it a commonplace book and the, the idea of that is it's sort of a humble daily thing, but really, it's proposing in many places something quite radical, which is kind of reaching for a different kind of knowledge or something, a new way of conceiving of how we might exist on the planet or laying out a little bit of what the stakes are for imagining a future. And I, I was also just struck by that, like the profound things that you are doing in your writing that also invite the reader in in this very sort of humble and welcoming way. Um, I don't know if there's a question in that really, but just to react to that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe, I guess we have about 14 minutes or so. Should we see if anybody has any comments or questions or remarks or? Brian Tier is raising his hand. Brian. Hey y'all, it's so lovely to see you both. And um, I just wanted to follow up on um, the question of pedagogy and the question of both of your books. I really love going to school with both of you. I feel like plastic is, is um, a deep education. And I also love being schooled by demystifications. Um, and there are very different kinds of pedagogy, I feel like. Um, and I just, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit, because I know, Allison, you had to educate yourself in many ways in order to write the book. And then Miranda, I feel like the the sort of shift with the aphorism um, also feels like a, a kind of new sort of set of techniques um, in your work. And so I guess I was just wondering of taking on this mantle of both educating the reader also feels new-ish. And I wonder um, if you could both speak about both the responsibility, the kind of ethics of that, but also how you're thinking of that as artists, as you're, as you're crafting these books, um, both of which I'm in love with. So I'm... Mm -hmm. I'm... <laughs> Do you want to go first, Allison? Do you want to respond? I can. Thank you, Brian, for being such a beautiful presence always and engaging with us. Um, yeah, so the plastic book has a lot of facts in it and a lot of traveling around, talking to people. And um, I, I did have to educate myself about a lot of things. One was some um, subtler colonialist apologies as Gloria wrote in the, in the um, chat there, the a thought of the co colonialist apologizing to the colonized without reparations. Um, I had to educate myself about how to be in that spot um, and and also how to um, how to engage with with communities and build relationships with with them that that um, were fruitful for everyone. And that's why I took the entangled knowledge part of from Karen Broad really seriously. I didn't want to 
just to be a person observing communities on the front lines of pollution, uh, parachuting in and documenting them or studying them and then leaving. I wanted to, um, for people who are willing to, to build relationships and that some people were willing and I've, I've formed some beautiful relationships out of that. Um, so one thing that I needed to learn was how to do that. Um, and I also just learned um, about the lives of, of people that had been hidden to me as a person with um, a lot of, a white person with a lot of privilege. And uh, so and that learning continues, I'm still engaged with one of those communities on an oral history project. And, and for me, the ethics is about it's, it's the same as the way of being apology. It's, it's a way of being. It's, it's a long-term commitment and set of relationships. Um, and also including with, with the knowledge and people in the book who are no longer here, you know, not living people anymore, but, but wanting to be, um, to, to, to be true. It's so hard to find the language to, for it, but to be to be responsible, I think, um, to their lives. Um, and so there is another turn in the book where I realized I've been reading all these technical histories and World War II histories, invention of radar and plastic chemistry. And I realized, oh, it was actually when I made that map, I looked at the map and I realized that I had left out nearly all the women. I had written the women out of the story because they'd been written out of the histories. So then I had this re-excavating work to do to locate the women. And that's uh, um, also a failed uh, project in some ways because some cannot be located. Uh, but th so that was then an excavation that I needed to do because of course that's also a self erasure um, as someone who identifies as female. So there, there's a lot of, I think, I think that, that part of the ethics too is just to keep asking, just to ask and ask and ask and ask and continue the queries. Um, another kind of way of being. And, um, material engagement thing. But Miranda, please. Yeah, I really love that question, Brian. Thank you. Um, and, and thanks for your response, Allison. I think what it helps bring to light for me is this kind of very expansive sense of pedagogy. Um, like, how can we take this, you know, what um, um, Ivan Illich calls the learning society? the notion of the learning society as a model. So that rather than thinking of learning as something that takes place in this bounded sort of institutional framework. And this for me goes to the political intimacy piece. You know, that if we have this kind of receptivity and pedagogical disposition towards these um, politically, you know, historically freighted relation asymmetrical relationships, um, of harm and power and, and so forth, um, I feel like pedagogy has something to offer as a, disp as a disposition, as a receptive disposition, although we may not in the most sort of common sense way think of, think of it that way, but I think since um, the history of, of radical pedagogy um, from and, and even experiential pedagogy, whether we're talking about Paolo Freire or John Dewey, we are talking about, um, um, it's related, I think, to, to, the, to the way of being of the apology, right? Like um, this openness that goes beyond, um, beyond the notion that um, of the subject who knows delivering content to the ever um, everlasting subject who doesn't know or something and passing, passing on um, with a, a there's a quote, there's a citation about this in Demystifications from Ranciere, which is, am I going to be able to find it? Um, I think that would be a good thing if I could. Um, so I, I suppose, you know, in terms of like learning from, um, from each other and listening and having an expansive idea of pedagogy, um, that goes to the heart of kind of, I think, what I want to be doing right now with, with writing. Um, yeah. Okay. So here it is. It's demystification number 66. Um, and, and there are two quotes in this one. Yeah. Page 81. Porpentine wrote, 
Laziness is not laziness. It is many things, avoiding encountering one's own body, avoiding triggers, avoiding thinking about the future because it's proven to be unbearable. And then here's the runs here. The master is always a length ahead of the student who always feels that in order to go farther, he must have another master supplementary explications. Thus does the triumphant Achilles drag Hector's corpse attached to his chariot around the city of Troy. Reasoned progress of knowledge is an indefinitely reproduced mutilation. Don't ask if the little educated child suffers from this mutilation. The system's genius is to transform loss into profit. The child advances. He has been taught, therefore he has learned, therefore he can forget. Behind him, the abyss of ignorance is being dug again. But here's the amazing part. From now on, the ignorance is someone else's. <laughs> so there, it's sort of like an image of learning as something that you want to, you somehow have to receive and then get rid of. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so thank you for that question, Brian. I hope, I hope we answered it. And I, I think well, we have like five more minutes, maybe one more question, or do you have? Yeah, we should have, someone else should ask if they want. I have a question, Alison, for you, because I have had, uh, I'm super excited this summer to see the expanded version, but my greatest familiarity is with the essay press version of plastic and autobiography. And one thing that I feel like is always tricky for any text is sort of like, when are you done with it? When is it something? But for this one, it seems even like, and especially because, you know, plot already in that essay press one, it felt like there were so many threads that were sort of like weaving together and so many ways it could go. Um, I'm curious when, when you knew it was, you were done working on it. Maybe I don't even want to say when you knew it was done, but like when you, you were done with it. When Lindsay Bolt, who is here, was like, give me the manuscript so I can edit it, Allison. <laughs> <laughs> Lindsay did a brilliant job of making it a much better book. So thank you, Lindsay. Um, truly, at, like I was writing it up to the last moment, which you usually don't do. Um, but I learned this wonderful lesson from a poet here in Portland named Kaya Sand, who's a poet and activist who, who also does all kinds of performances sort of that are outside the book related to her books. And she taught me that you know, a book is a thing, but but the act of writing it and the project is the life and it all continues. And so, as I mentioned briefly, I'm doing an oral history project with one of these communities in Texas. And so I just continue the engagements of the book and I I don't worry too much about it. I, I got a gift to, that enabled me to impose a tidy little ending on the book because I take my plastic car part, which is also here with me, um, across the country and return it to its Honda Odyssey plant. Um, they came from an Odyssey minivan. Um, so we took it back to the plant and that made it tight, which they, I tried to give it to them, but they didn't want it. Um, so that was a little tidy ending for the book, but it really continues. And I guess I just don't worry too much about it. Um, yeah. I did want to just uh, say one thing I was thinking though, one of the, your other great lines in the in the book, Miranda is about, and you read it as that vulnerability, that timeless, what is, what is the word? Antique? No. Antique. And timeless antique. I love that because I do I think the things we were talking about with pedagogy is that is vulnerability, right? Like it's you're you make yourself vulnerable in the so-called position of teacher and asymmetrical power to become also the student. And I really felt that also in this in the work with these communities that I have all of this cultural capital and access that some people in these communities lack. And they have wholly different kinds of expertise and knowledge that I completely lack. And for those who are willing to um, apprentice me, which is how they think of it, um, that was not something that I formulated. This woman agreed that she would make herself my mentor. Um, then the knowledge has uh, flown very much in two directions. Um, and so that's, I think, been a really powerful engagement.
Well, so much appreciation to everyone for being with us. This has just been really lovely. And, and thank you, Allison. And thank you, our friends at Orca Books Co-op. Thank and you. all of you for being here. It's just really appreciate it. And don't forget to support Orca Books when this book comes in next week. Is that right? This is a beautiful book and the index and the whole thing is amazing. It's so, so worth your purchase at Orca Books. Thank you. Thank you for plugging. <laughs> and thank you so much for the beautiful conversation. Yeah, thanks for having us. All right. Thank you, guys. This was great. Bye, we'll friend. Have a beautiful night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>